Sam Cobble. Hi, uh, Sam Carbo from Australian Associated Press. Uh, sorry, Lord Moncton, you, you say that you should reject the consensus, but isn't a scientific consensus a consensus of evidence rather than a consensus of opinion? And um, you say that you're willing to be convinced. What would it take for you to be convinced that climate change was happening? Right. First of all, climate change has been happening for the last 4,567 million years since that Tuesday on which the world first formed and the first wisps of the atmosphere. So, of course, I do not deny that climate change is happening, nor do I deny that if we add CO2 to the atmosphere, some warming is likely to result. But as a specialist in the field of the determination of climate sensitivity, and I lecture on this, as I've said, at faculty level, I can assure you that there is no agreement among those scientists who have studied that question on how much warming there is going to be. And I have already adduced evidence from the Royal Society who have said exactly that in terms in their restatement of the science on climate just this year. So uh, science, if you're saying that a scientific consensus is somehow not a consensus of opinion, but a consensus of evidence, you have to say, and you did not say, what evidence you mean. On the evidence that I have seen, let us just take one example of it. If we go back to 1750, how much warming has there been since then? Well, using the Central England temperature record as a proxy for global temperatures, it's not bad for that purpose, it's at the right latitude. We've had 0.9 Celsius of warming in response to an addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere by us, which is almost equivalent to a doubling of CO2 concentration. That's going to give you around 1 Celsius of warming per doubling of CO2 concentration. Over the last 60 years, we again see 1 Celsius of warming per century happening. All the evidence points to one Celsius of warming for a doubling of CO2 and not the 3.3 predicted by the IPCC as its central estimate on current emissions or the 5.1 Celsius over the next 90 years predicted by your government. These are exaggerations which are not the consensus in the literature. And you should understand that the literature is much wider and reflects far more scientific opinions than many of you have been willing to allow or discover. Get on with your work. Um, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that sceptics so often take the best case scenario they can find in the science and the worst case scenario they can find in the economics and convince themselves that having chosen two extreme positions it would be crazy to act. Um, there, is, uh, there is a range of evidence, but, and I'll put all this up on our, our website for people who are interested, but the Joint Academy's statement, the Bureau of Meteorology, the CSIRO, the National Academy of Sciences have all formed an entirely different view than Lord Monckton. So I just think we have to be very careful about distinguishing uh, consensus and expertise and opinion from the fact that uh, uh, the, the groups that we trust, hopefully that we trust to advise us on these, have, un have uniformly agreed on the conclusion, even if there is some doubt remaining about uh, the decimal places. So, uh, again, choosing the best case science you can find, comparing it to the worst case economics you can find, is a very narrow and dangerous way to run a policy debate. Next question from Jennifer Bennett. Uh, hello, Jennifer Bennett from Campus Review. Uh, question for Lord Moncton. You're often critical of climate change scientists because they don't like to go head to head with you in a public debate. Australian scientists have told us that a debate forum doesn't allow the time and format necessary for communicating complex information. If you're so certain of the facts, why not debate the scientists on their own terms? Why won't you submit the research you say you've undertaken to a quality peer reviewed journal to be assessed? I wonder why it is that Professor Tim Flannery, who knows no more about climate science than I do, is never asked that question. Why Al Gore is never asked that question. Why Professor Stefford is never asked that question. And may I perhaps refer the Honourable Lady to Physics and Society for July 
2008, where you will find an article entitled Climate Sensitivity Reconsidered. The author is Christopher Walter Monckton of Brenchley, and the article was indeed reviewed by Professor Alvin Saperstein, the Professor of Physics at uh, Wayne State University, and also the review editor of the journal Concerned at the time. The American Physical Society, yes, that's right. Indeed it does. So why don't you check with Professor Saperstein to find out whether he in fact reviewed it. Have you done that? No, I didn't think you had. Once again, please will you do your homework. What I'm saying is, if you take a preconceived position on this question, and therefore you don't check both sides of what you are told, rather than only checking my side because you're on the other side, then you will not get a balanced view on this question. Uh, The fact is that I am under no more obligation to publish in the peer-reviewed literature on this than anyone else. I have published in the reviewed literature. They try to say it wasn't peer review now, but they were perfectly happy to say it was peer review at the time. They were lent upon. This happens. You know, we too are sometimes victims of the other side going too far and putting too much pressure on. The two editors of that journal were sacked for publishing that that paper. They shouldn't have been. It was a perfectly acceptable paper. There's not a lot wrong with it scientifically. And so read that if you want to see what my uh, opinion is on climate sensitivity. It contains 30 relatively clear equations, each one of which the professor required me to justify in order that they could be included in the paper. It was a very thorough scientific review. Thank you. Just to follow up. Jennifer, Jennifer, I'm going to give Richard Ryder a reply. Thank you. You've had your t- I'm going to give Richard right a reply. Thank you very much. Well, look, I, I, I agree uh, with Lord Monckton. I urge you to do your homework. Uh, I urge you to... Um, well, we'll put links up on this to our website tomorrow, but, you know, it doesn't take long on the internet to find uh, comprehensive, uh, systematic and, as you said, timely. It takes a bit of time to work through, uh, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the misnomers in this li- the science. The problem is that it, it only takes a minute to start a bushfire and can take a week to put one out. You know, that's why the scientists don't like these debates, because asking tricky questions is, uh, is quicker than answering them. And the point about Tim Flannery and Al Gore... Well, of course, uh, neither of them claim to be climate scientists, but what they're doing is speaking, they're standing on the shoulders of those thousands of climate scientists who have done the work, who have done the equations, who have collected the data, who have, uh, who have questioned each other and settled on a conclusion. So I please, I urge you to do exactly the homework. Uh, that Lord Monckton is urging you to do because these claims, these questions have been asked uh, many times. I've heard them asked many times, but the answers don't seem to have any impact on on the questioners. Next question, Jacqueline Malley. Um, Jacqueline Malley from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, Lord Monckton, um, you said that the carbon tax is a non or the wrong solution to a non-problem. I'm just interested in your views on um, the coalition's direct action policy. It's also a proposed solution to what you say is a, a non-problem. Um, should the coalition ditch it? Yes, the coalition should, in my opinion, ditch it because there is no need to take any action about cl- carbon dioxide at all. That is why Canada has announced that she is not going to participate in a Kyoto 2. Japan has announced the same. America, even America, has announced the same. China has announced that if she has a carbon tax at all, it will be at just $1.50 per tonne. Why, therefore, set your own working people at a huge disadvantage by imposing upon them a carbon tax at a rate which is unmatched anywhere else in the world and which most other countries are no longer going to pursue. It is not good enough merely to recite that there is a consensus of thousands of climate scientists. The number of climate scientists who, by measurement, observation and experiment and by the application of established theory to the results, have even attempted to determine climate sensitivity, which is how much warming we are going to get, numbers not in the thousands, but in the dozens. And most of those have concluded that the matter is indeed 
highly uncertain, and some of them, such as Professor Richard Lindzen and his uh, colleague Young Sang Choi, in a paper published earlier this year, have determined that the amount of outgoing radiation reaching space is far greater than that which would allow high climate sensitivity, and they estimate, once again, that there would be less than one Celsius degree of warming for a doubling of CO2 concentration. We might also cite uh, Spencer and Braswell, 2010, who have said similar things, having at last measured the cloud feedback and found it to attenuate global warming by as much as the IPCC had thought it increased it. And I could go on reciting paper after paper after paper done by measurement and observation, which clearly establishes the strong likelihood that climate sensitivity is low. And therefore, it is not acceptable to say the science is settled. You must read the literature and read it widely and understand that there is no consensus on this, there can be no consensus on this, and the way things are turning out at the moment, the likelihood of high climate sensitivity of any problem whatsoever with the climate is very small indeed. And of course, uh, of course, that, uh, that the literature that's being referred to there is, is a trivial percentage of the overwhelming evidence. Again, the Joint Academies, the Bureau of Meteorology, NASA. Uh, you know, I just refer you back. If you really believe, if you really believe that uh, that NASA can't be trusted, that their data can't be trusted, uh, then perhaps you shouldn't use your GPS, and you might want to ask some hard questions about the moon landing. Um, <laughs> But again, the, your actual question was, why, where is the sceptic's concern with direct action? Where is, if you are genuinely worried about the cost of tackling climate change, and every economist uh, is of the view, or again, Tony Abbott can't find a single economist to, to agree with him that his scheme is cheaper, if you believe climate change is bunkum, which I don't think is based on the evidence, but if you believe that, you should be more concerned that we would waste billions more dollars tackling it through an inexpensive scheme. Why are climate sceptics economic sceptics as well? Thank you. Next question from Alex Hart. Alex Hart from the Seven Network. Sorry for interrupting there. Um, I'm not sure if it's the right title to use, but my question is to Lord Monckton. I'm asking about a letter that was written to you by David Beamish from the UK clerk of the parliament over there saying that he'd like you to stop claiming that you are a member of the House of Lords. What's your response to this? Will you stop using that title? Uh, why or why not? And does it harm your credibility? Um, sir, would you be kind enough to read out the words in this box on the passport page? The holder is the Right Honourable Christopher Walter Viscount Monckton of Brenchley. Thank you very much. The House of Lords says I'm not a member of it. My passport says I am. Get used to it. <laughs> What I will do, therefore, since I had, as a condition of taking part in this debate, insisted that ad hominem questions of that futile and drivelling kind should not be asked, I'm going to take a free kick and I'm going to get back to the climate, which is what we are here to debate, not the way the House of Lords works. The IPCC's... No, sir. The IPCC's estimates of the amount of warming from a doubling of CO2 concentration, 2 to 4.5 Celsius, with a central estimate 3.26 Celsius, suggest a feedback loop gain in the climate system of between 0.42 and 0.74, with a central estimate 0.64. However, that is a near impossibility, physically speaking, because in any object on which feedbacks operate, if the feedback loop gain is greater than somewhere in a range of 0.01 to 0.1, the object becomes terminally unstable, and under conditions which might quite easily occur, the loop gain would reach one and the system would blow itself apart. Since this hasn't happened, we have a very good evidence from process engineering in this case that once again the likely rate of warming for a doubling of CO2 is one Celsius degree. Thank you. Richard? 